Research Questions and Hypothesis By the end of this session, you should be able to distinguish among purpose statements, research questions, hypotheses, and objectives. Define the nature of a variable and the types of variables in quantitative research. Define a theory and its test using variables. Write quantitative purpose statements, research questions and hypotheses. Identify similarities and differences between quantitative as well as with qualitative purpose statements and research questions. Define a central phenomenon in qualitative research. Write qualitative purpose statements and research questions. This graphic shows us a matrix displaying purpose statements, research questions, hypotheses, and objectives. On the leftmost column, we see intent, form, use, and placement. And here, on the top row, we see the purpose statement, research questions, hypotheses, and research objectives. So when we take a look at intent for the purpose statement, it provides overall direction. For the research questions, the intent is to raise questions that need to be answered, hypothesis, to make predictions about expectations, and for research objectives, the intent is to state goals. Form, for most of these items, we see that it should be written up in one or more sentences. When we take a look at use for the purpose statement, uh, quantitative and qualitative research, uh, these are used in purpose statements. The same goes for research questions. It is employed both in quantitative and qualitative domains. As mentioned in earlier presentations, in earlier sessions, hypotheses are essentially used only for quantitative research. And then research objectives, typically only for quantitative research as well. Placement, the purpose statement is usually located at the end of the introduction. And then when you take a look at research questions, hypotheses, and research objectives, they are also found in the end of the introduction, after the literature review, or perhaps in a separate section of the study. Why are these statements and questions important? Because they represent major signposts. That the first, that's the first reason. They help identify appropriate methods, and they help link intent with the results. What do we need to know to design quantitative purpose statements, research questions and hypotheses? We need to know three main notions. We need to be familiar with these variables, theory, and the elements that go into these statements and questions. So a variable is a characteristic or attribute that can be measured right here and, and that it varies. right? When we said it can be measured, it can be assessed on an instrument and recorded on an instrument. When it varies, we're saying that it can assume different values or scores for different individuals. Let's take a look at some examples. Leadership style, organizational control, autism. These are examples of variables. We also have some concepts that are difficult but possibly measurable variables like socialization, imagination, intuition, discrimination. But when we talk about uh, some other notions like subconscious thoughts, world poverty seen from different viewpoints, and stereotypes, it's almost impossible to measure these types of variables. Now, when we take a look at variables, when we take a look at them from the perspective of being a measure, that we usually describe them as either categorical or continuous. A categorical measure is a value of a variable assigned by the researcher into a small number of categories, for example, gender. The category of gender can be divided into male and female, for example. Another measure is what we refer to as a continuous measure. That is the value of a variable assigned by the researcher to a point along a continuum of scores from low too high. For example, age, right? So one could be 15 years old and another could be 95 years old. So there's a continuous, there's a continuum of scores ranging from low to high. A variable is an attribute or characteristic stated in a specific or applied way, right? It's very specific. Uh, 
and it is usually seen in an applied manner. A construct is an attribute or characteristic expressed in a more abstract and general way. For example, if you take a look at this, student achievement right, is essentially a, a construct. Right? And in order to be able to um, make sense of what student achievement is, the grade point average is an example of a variable. It's very specific, right? Um, and uh, there's really no confusion about what this means. But when you talk about student achievement, it's, it's a very abstract concept. One way to look at it from a quantitative perspective is that it can be measured by, by grade point averages. If one looks at it from a qualitative viewpoint, it could be student satisfaction, it could be student voice. So a construct is um, abstract and more general. Let's take a look at the families of variables in quantitative studies. So we have um, usually this notation probable cause, x, and uh, y would be intervening variables, and we have the effect of the dependent variables. So the independent variables can also be called treatment or measured variables. They can also be called control variables, moderating variables. In between the probable cause and the effect, you find intervening variables. And in between the probable cause and effect, you have other variables that you have no control of, but have an impact on the dependent variables. These are called confounding variables. Intervening variables, you actually um, are aware of them or you control them. Confounding variables, you were not aware that they actually have an impact, and they're usually beyond your control. A dependent variable is an attribute or characteristic influenced by the independent variable. It can also be called the outcome, the effect, the criterion, or the consequences. An independent variable is an attribute or characteristic that influences or affects an outcome or dependent variable. So the various independent variables could be treatment, measured, control, and moderating variables. An intervening variable or mediating variables is a characteristic that stands between the dependent and independent variables. Let's take a look at an example of an intervening variable. Let's start from step one. We want to find out how often or how frequent students seek help from faculty. So an independent variable that we could identify could be convenient office hours for students, right? If the office hours are convenient for students, we can assume that because of this cause, the effect would be that students seek more help from faculty. That's a pretty simple step. Now, what if there's an intervening variable? So let's say convenient office hours for students is the independent variable. But an intervening variable could be that students become willing or their willingness to take risks. What does this mean? Well, in some cultures, in some contexts, when students are seen to seek help from faculty, some students might think that uh, this is a sign of weakness and that this is a risk. Um, they, are, they get to be known by the, the faculty member and they could be under what the students might imagine as closer scrutiny. So this could be an intervening variable. Now, what happens is that um, uh, when we take a look at it in this, in this lowest row here, the independent variable is convenient office hours for students. That is a cause, and the effect is that students seek help from faculty, but there could be some intervening variables in between. That is, what is the willingness of the student to take risks? from the perception of students. This is an example of an intervening variable. Now, confounding variables are also referred to as spurious variables. These are attributes or characteristics that the researcher cannot directly measure because their effects cannot be easily separated from the other variables, even though they may influence the relationship between the independent and the dependent variable. Right? Let's go back to that. So, spurious variables means that uh, cannot directly measure it. It's, um, you know that it, it may exist, but because of the circumstances that you encounter, it just can't be measured. For example, we are looking at um, 
one of my two of my uh, PhD students are from Saudi Arabia, and they're looking at the impact of uh, teachers' exposure to ICT in terms of their uh, familiarity with teaching the English language. Now, a limitation that we have for for the research that these students of mine are doing is that we are only looking at uh, at men, at, at the male population, right? Uh, so whatever results we get um, is is really uh, tempered by the fact that we were only looking at uh, at at one particular independent variable and one level, only the males. There are other variables out there that could possibly impact the results of how teachers in a particular context view their abilities as, a, as these are influenced by ICT knowledge and skills. But because of the context that we experience, unfortunately we cannot uh, um, get data from, from females because that's a limitation in the culture that my PhD students are experiencing. Theories as bridges between independent and dependent variables. So uh, when we attempt to be able to explain relationships between independent variables, taking into account um, the intervening variables and even confounding variables, then what we are attempting to do is we're trying to bridge this gap through theories. Now, different types of explanations in quantitative research. We could uh, look at it in, in this, by using this particular graphic. Uh, this column here represents um, a continuum of no test all the way to extensive tests by other researchers. Right, so, and it can also be seen as a narrow application to broader abstractions, what we could call uh, greater generalizations. So we start by looking at an explanation posed by a researcher, by an author, by you, for example, as a hunch as to why an independent variable relates to the dependent variable. You think that this is how um, a particular independent variable, say, um, knowledge of uh, a particular language, let's say the English language, is the independent variable. And the dependent variable would be performance in high-stakes tests. So your hunch is that uh, well, maybe if the independent variable is measured as scoring high, I mean, if students have a greater facility in language, then most probably their scores in high-stakes tests, the dependent variable will be high. That's your hunch. There's no test there, and it can only be narrowly applied perhaps to anecdotal evidence, examples of your cousins or your friends who fit this particular pattern. The next step is to go and explore theoret theoretical rationales. These are posed by other authors based on studies for relationship. You may read that uh, some authors have actually proven that uh, English language proficiency leads to high scores in, uh, in, in high-stakes testing. Right? That, that could be your theoretical rationale. So you're moving up. And then you move on to the conceptual framework. And this is often expressed as a visual model by other authors for other relationships. So in other words, what you're doing is you're looking at a theory and then you intend to test it and you employ a visual model of a conceptual framework. So you say in your model that on the left-hand side you have skills in language proficiency and then you draw an arrow saying that it is related to performance in high-stakes tests and literacy tests and numeracy tests. That's your conceptual framework. And it is based on what you have seen, what you have read, the theoretical framework. And then finally, you reach this level where you conduct extensive tests and you are able to make broad abstractions. A formal theory uh, is therefore expressed by connected hypotheses and variables that you have identified. So let's say your hunch, you moved it along the theory, You've conceptualized it and you have tested it. You got a sample of students from uh, a broad base from let's say the entire nation of Australia and you measured their, uh, their language skills and then you compared it with how they performed in high stakes tests and you're able to see a very clear relationship. That's how explanations are conducted in quantitative research.
What are the elements of a quantitative purpose statement? A quantitative purpose statement identifies the variables, the relationship, and the participants inside for the research. Guidelines, use a single sentence, use wording such as the purpose of the study. If using a theory, state the theory you plan to test, it's important. And then use quantitative words, relate, compare, and describe in looking at relationships between your variables. Continuing this discussion about the elements of quantitative purpose statements, guidelines for writing, the independent variable should usually be in the first position in a sentence, and a dependent variable is the second position in a sentence. If there are control and mediating variables, there should be, they should be in the third position in your sentence. Talk about the research side, talk about the participants. What about quantitative research questions? What are the types of quantitative research questions? Well, these questions describe results of your variables, it compares two or more groups on the independent variable in terms of the dependent variable. In other words, two or more groups. Uh, we're looking at gender and we're looking at age. Two independent variables in relation to student achievement, for example, which is a dependent variable. So you're looking at how these two groups relate to student achievement. And then you relate two or more variables. You relate age and you relate gender, for example. Guidelines for writing, pose a question, begin with how, what, or why. Specify the independent, dependent, and mediating or control variables. Then use the words describe, compare, relate to indicate the action or connection among the variables. Indicate participants and research side of your study. What are research hypotheses? You have what is referred to as a null hypothesis. And in quantitative research, it operates almost in, in a counterintuitive fashion. When we intend to establish a relationship between two variables, let's say, on the one hand, we want to take a look at language proficiency and performance in high-stakes tests, our null hypothesis is that there is no relationship that exists between them. In other words, there's no change in the dependent variable, right? right? For example, there will be no significant difference in test scores. Uh, I mentioned language proficiency. In this graphic, it says between fifth grade boys and girls, on the XYZ achievement test. That's the null hypothesis. And the purpose of quantitative research is to actually either reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. You have a directional alternative hypothesis where you specify the direction of the change in the dependent variable the researcher predicts will take place. You might say that the fifth grade girls will have higher scores on the XYZ achievement test than fifth grade boys. Non-directional alternative hypothesis essentially is just debunking the null hypothesis. It does not specify the direction of the change in the dependent variable. So essentially you say there's no difference, that's the null hypothesis, but once you've tested it by gathering data and comparing the scores, you therefore make a conclusion saying that there will be a difference in test scores on the XYZ achievement test for fifth grade boys and girls. You essentially um, reject the null hypothesis. Research hypothesis, how do we write these? We state the variables in this order. Independent, first position, dependent, second position, and control, third position. When we compare, we explicitly state the groups. If variables are related, we specify the relationship between these variables. We make a prediction about changes that we expect in the groups. This is our hypothesis. This is the, the, the real heart of the hypothesis. We make a prediction. The null hypothesis is a prediction. And then the results of the test of a hypothesis, either we reject or fail to reject, that's the result of our prediction. And then we state information about the participants in the site unless it repeats information already stated in the purpose statement. Now let's uh, talk about qualitative purpose statements and research questions. I'm doing this so that you can compare how qualitative, is, how qualitative statements are different from quantitative statements. So, Understand how these statements and questions differ from quantitative research. Understand the role of a central phenomenon in qualitative research, as mentioned in earlier sessions. Uh, in qualitative research, we usually do not uh, subscribe to the use of hypotheses. We talk about central phenomenon, and then we need to understand qualitative research as an emerging process. What are differences between quantitative and qualitative purpose statements and research questions? This graphic shows us that for quantitative statements, they're more closed, Qualitative, they're more open-ended. For quantitative, it's usually probable cause and effect. Why did it happen? There's a use of theories. Why did it happen in view of an explanation of a theory? Then we assess the difference in magnitude. How much happened? How many times did it happen? What were the differences among groups and what happened? 
For qualitative research, it's essentially descriptive. You just say what happened, and it's interpretive. What was the meaning to people of what happened? And it's process-oriented. What happened over time? Explaining or predicting variables versus exploring or understanding a central phenomenon. It's another way of comparing quantitative and qualitative research purpose statements. All right, so for quantitative, there is this idea of explaining or predicting variables. The independent variable X influences or does not influence a dependent variable Y. And if it does so, how much? To what extent? For qualitative research, we were looking at uh, the central phenomenon represented as Y. We're just using Y so that it's consistent with quantitative research. Uh, we are able to obtain an in-depth understanding of Y, the central phenomenon, by looking at the external forces and also internal forces that shape and are shaped by the central phenomenon. Two qualitative research considerations. The focus of the research is around a central phenomenon, not hypothesis which is an issue or a process that the researcher would like to study. Qualitative research is built on an emerging design. Elements of a qualitative purpose statement, single sentence, statements such as the purpose of this study, etc. You state a central phenomenon, a statement identifying the type of qualitative design is important, and that was what we discussed in the previous session. Qualitative words such as explore, understand, discover is, is usually employed. There's mention of the participants and the research site. Types of qualitative research questions, you have the central question, it's the overarching question you explore. There are sub-questions, and these can be divided into issue sub-questions or procedural sub-questions. The issues narrow the focus into specific issues. The procedural sub-questions indicate the steps to be used in analyzing the data in a qualitative study. And of course, we have the interview questions, the questions that are asked during your interview that are based on the sub-questions and central question. I suggest that you undertake this individual work, looking at the suggested article by Paul and Anderson, the Pressure to Perform, Reviewing the Use of Data Through Professional Learning Conversations. I'd like you to sort of reverse engineer this article, identify the key research problem, recognize the literature used, spot the purpose of the research, ascertain how data was collected, determine how analysis and interpretation was made, and describe how reporting and evaluation was done. Why are you doing this, reverse engineering? In quantitative and qualitative research, there's a big, there's a very strong school of thought that says that the best way for, for practitioners and scholars to learn is to delve into primary sources. So looking at articles and the findings that are generated in these articles is an example of using primary sources. It is way better than using textbooks. Uh, so again, this is a, a perspective that uh, some teachers of research adhere to, including myself. I think it's best for students to learn the concepts of research by actually undertaking it, not by reading the textbook. Nothing wrong with reading textbooks. It's just that it gives you superficial knowledge. It gives you knowledge that you don't use. You don't get to apply. But if you reverse engineer an article, and try to find out its problems, recognize the literature used, spot the purpose of the research, ascertain how data was collected, then you actually are able to apply some skills that you have learned. And in that manner, and in that fashion, you're able to learn quantitative research. In relation to the article that attempts to relate teacher characteristics with student achievement, give your comments as a personal reflection on how a relationship between teachers' practices in the article it's described as professional learning support how is this relationship affect student achievement? Or what can you discover by making use of this type of research? I'll give examples. How useful would information about the relationship of teachers' practices, for example, professional learning support, as using this article, and student achievement be to schools, to teachers, to you, for example? Be specific and give examples. That ends this particular session. If you have questions and clarifications, please do not hesitate to get in touch with me through the email indicated on the screen. Thank you.